go to a few different verses tonight in our teaching on the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. The big question tonight is, who is he? Who is the Holy Spirit? We have gone through the biblical perspectives of the Spirit in terms of, we started weeks ago when we said that there's no whole teaching of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. There is not a, um, a complete, not even a full chapter in all of Scripture to tell us who he is, what his role is, what his function is. We have a lot of imagery in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. We talked about the imagery of the Spirit, the language of the Spirit throughout the Old Testament. Um, we talked about the need of use, for using, using our imagination. We talked about the need um, to uh, understand metaphors and culture and all that kind of thing to understand who the Spirit is. And then we looked at New Testament scripture um, to see how the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is and, and what the scripture teaches about him. And um, we talked about some of his function. We talked about some of the things that he does that we know about. Um, and, and this was a major part of our conversation from week one and week two. We talked about our view of the Spirit in terms of, um, as, as Deacon Tabitha was praying tonight, not just seeing him only for the church, not just seeing the Holy Spirit only active in a believer's life, but seeing the Holy Spirit as God in a cosmic role, cosmic in that um, it's not just with humanity, but all of creation, because he is the spirit that is God, the giver of all life. So everything that is living, everything that is created, everything that um, exists, um, the Holy Spirit is there. And that the Holy Spirit, we talked about, uh, our language was passive and active presence of the spirit, but we looked at the Holy Spirit Tonight we'll talk a little bit more about his essence, but we looked at, at him as the energy of God, the energy of God and how the Holy Spirit is actually, hear this, in every single person, Christian or non-Christian, Buddhist or Muslim or non-believer or atheist, the worst of the sinners, that the Holy Spirit is present. And we pull that from the Bible. Because the Bible says, where can I go? You're not present. Yes? We, we looked at scripture that talks about him being the life giver. The, the, so if you're alive, that's evidence of the Spirit's presence. But we did talk about the difference between his energies, his charismatic presence. That's reserved for believers in Christ. Amen? The work of sanctification of the Spirit, the the some of the things that he does. Last week we ended talking a little bit about theosis, uh, this Greek word that talks to us about divinization or deification, uh, making us to be more like God. Um, it is him sanctifying and doing a work in us so that we capture the likeness of who God is. He's, he's working in us on a daily basis um, through that energy, through, that's the best definition we have, and we'll look at some of that tonight. He's working on us to make us be more like Christ. Amen? And, and working the sin issue in our life out and doing all of this work, and that he's a co-laborer even with our faith, that there's a role that we have uh, in the process, but it is what he's doing. Okay, so what I want to do tonight is I want to talk a little bit about who is he and let me just ask, we don't need to pass the mic around this, uh, we, we, we can hear you from the back. And so let me just, but speak loudly so I can hear you. Uh, let me just ask, where in the Bible does it help you? It's not a theological question, it is subjective to you. Where in the Bible does it help you to understand who he is? Who is he? What scripture is the one that helped you to say, oh, this is, who is, this is who the Holy Spirit is? Even if you don't remember the, my father used to call it the first and last name. That's the, the text, the, the book and the, and the chapter and verse. 
say that loud enough? I have to go, but I'll send the comforter. So who, who is he? Jesus is saying that about the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. Mm -hmm. That always made me think about a big blanket, but that's another issue. All right, yeah. go ahead. And so what it made you think about who he is? It makes me, it, it proves to me or makes me feel like the spirit was always present. Just as God is eternal, so is the spirit. Okay, so you established. So we didn't just become a New Testament phenomenon he's not a in new, Acts 2. Okay, he's not a New Testament phenomenon just in Acts 2, but he's always there from the beginning over the waters. Yeah. Like a bird. Yeah. She said it's bird terminology because that he was moving over the waters, hovering is a, that's the bird terminology right there. Like a, um, a hen over the egg, you know, over the chicks. It's hovering over them. Um, anybody else? Say that? The Ruah of God. The Ruah of God. So that made you see him as? Somebody that can be in me, inhaled, and strengthen me, give me life. The ruach, the wind of God, the breath. The, the, the breath that God blew into uh, Adam. The breath that God blew into Adam. Uh, Sister Lulu? Go ahead, be, do this a little louder. John 3.16. Okay. That's a really great Augustinian approach to the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you know that. But St. Augustine, 4th century Latin bishop, where most of the theology on the Holy Spirit that the Western Church knows today comes from Augustine. And his issue was that the Holy Spirit is the very love that unites the Father to the Son and all humanity to God. He is love. So for God so loved the world, he said the exact same thing you did. That's the Holy Ghost right there. But go ahead. You own it. Look at you. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Augustina. Sister Augustina. Uh, go ahead. Number, no, go ahead. Or the second one, then we'll come to Pat. Go ahead. And what does that make you? How does that? How do you connect the Holy Spirit? Okay. Be still to wait for his instruction. Yeah. And know that he's got it. Interesting. That's good. All right. Pat? Um, for me, is uh, doubt comes when you met him uh, because he he wanted to see him. He wouldn't believe until he saw Jesus. And mm -hmm. when he appeared to him, he said, you know, touch me and see that I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here. And when he did that, his faith, you know, he believed. But then... Just like Jesus was there, he was gone. Okay. Just that quick. So it's like to know that, you know, because of Thomas, did, he just wouldn't believe. He had to do something to really show him. So you're saying that Jesus, in in taking Thomas's doubts away by appearing and disappearing, physically, physically doing it, that, but he did that through the Holy Spirit. Right. He would you know, not believe. There's a lot of people today. So, so for you, when you see that in the scripture, that right. makes you think the Holy Spirit is. Well, I know he's real. He's alive. Mm. To me, and that says to me, you know, even though I can't see him, but I know I feel it in my heart. Gotcha. I believe. Go I got gotcha. you. Right. Like the Holy Spirit goes out of his way to prove himself. To right. Him. He, he do whatever it takes. Okay. Go ahead. The Jesus bird, the dove flying <laughs> and landing on Jesus. Not He's okay. not a pigeon. That's why the kids call it a pigeon. All right. Okay, so we have a lot of imagery, but now you notice that all of the dots that you are connecting are indeed dots that you are connecting because there was not one scripture mentioned right now that told us who the Holy Spirit is. 
you drew conclusions and pieced it together your own self on, and I'm going to say this, on some other teachings that you had already undergirded in you. He must be this because he's, you already knew he was God because they told you that. Yeah? And then you learned a little bit of something about something and then you went back to the scripture and you brought your theology to the scripture to say that must be the Holy Spirit right there. Does that make sense to you? Because not one outside of the one that Tabitha said that the Holy Spirit is the comforter in John, in, in, in John outside of that, not one of the Bible verses you mentioned, which is my point, explicitly tells us this is who he is. We have to guess, we have to use theories, we have to put theology, a, a construct of teachings and understanding that we, know we have of who God is in order to fill in the blank. Yes? In the Bible, I know there's different versions of the Bible. Um, when he said, I will send you another advocate, does that correlate with comforter? Or yeah. Is that a separate advocate, comforter, they correlate with each other. Yep, it's a, para, it's a paraclete. It's just translated different into English. Um, so um, we had that word up here a few weeks ago, the paraclete, right? And so that's, that's what he's saying. You were going to say something? I'm looking for it, but also a lot in the scripture it says the spirit of the Lord came and the spirit of the Lord just not substitute. The way he moves, but not who he is. Exactly. There's a lot of verses in the scripture that says the spirit of the Lord this, the spirit of the Lord that, and it describes things he does. And it tells us things that result because of his presence. But none of those verses tell us who he is. You will find Bible verses and chapters written on who Jesus is. Entire books for us to understand who he is. Right? Who his mother and his father are. Who his brothers and sisters are. Who his disciples were. What his ministry was like. Where was he born? How do we know that he, him and the Father are one? What did he say about himself, right? And we have all the scriptures that tell us about the Father, all the prophets, all of the law. In the New Testament, we have everyone talking about the Father, Jesus himself, describing him as Father, the very, the very name that we get him, the Father. No one does that about the Spirit. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to look at some things because in the early years of the church, this was an issue. We were trying to piece it together. We were trying to get all the things that you just mentioned here today are based on a theology, a working theology that the early church fathers gave us. Because we didn't, they, they didn't have one at all. <laughs> they had to go back and study scripture to put what we have today together, and then we draw from those things and move on. So what I want to do is I want to look at, I, I, I titled it, Who... who the Holy Spirit is, or who is He? Yes. I'm trying to hurry up and find it, but so how do you explain? This is Jesus talking Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Mm -hmm. He mentioned the Holy Spirit in that. Yes, there's mentions of the Holy Spirit, but there is nowhere where He's telling you who is He, what's His nature, what's His character, how does He relate to the Father and to the Son? Is He lesser than them? Who, which one of them does he come from? We know the relationship father, son, obviously who's the lead there. What's the lead with the spirit? What position does he come in? Why do we say he's the third in the, in the Godhead? Is he subservient to Jesus? Which I understand why she feels like he's there because, you know, he does specify that he's a comfort. He's a comfort. Which is the Holy Spirit. So. And, and, and the way your wife said it, I send you a, another advocate right. is what it actually says, which means that the first advocate was Jesus. That the next advocate is the Holy Spirit, but they're both described using the same terminology. They're both paracletes. Yeah, I think the way the way the Bible sets us up for Je for God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and the way that they appear in the Bible gives us the God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. the, that the, the script the, the, of, the way it's framed the works, in the Bible. The works of God the Father. It, it's framed in this way, yeah. Exactly. That that you have Father, Son, Spirit yeah. in, in that order. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. So what I want to do tonight is I want to go through 
teaching from the Orthodox Church about who the Holy Spirit is in orthodoxy. And I'm using orthodoxy not to convert us to orthodoxy, but to say this is where the original teachings come from so we can understand how it was structured. Now, before I do that, I want to read these verses. Can we go there to the book of John? Because I want to show you some of the, some of the um, problems that we have. Some of the problems we have uh, come from Scripture itself. Okay? And this is where it's going to help you. Particularly, um, I'm going to start with this term, the filioque. Anybody remember what this word means? Or what, what it's referencing? Yeah, perfect. And from the sun. Mm -hmm. um, the filioque is a reference. If you go back to the series we did a couple months ago at the beginning of the year on the creeds of the church and that the church creeds talk about who the Father is, who the Spirit, who the Son is, who the Spirit is. That in the Latin, the word filioque is, 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 is Latin. Let me put it here. By the way, which, which part of the church decided to use Latin? The Ro West, Roman. So Eastern church, that's we're going back now to 1054. That's, that's first schism. The big issue was you all are taking the Holy Scriptures and you're switching the language. There's going to be a lot of problems. Part of the problem is, is that when you switch language, one, one tongue has words and meanings and the other tongue doesn't. And so they took, in the Latin, they used this word and they inserted it into the creeds. You know, the Nietzschean Creed that we recite every Sunday that describe to us what our faith is because they didn't have Bibles, remember, originally. And so it's important to understand who God is. And the whole church and all the bishops and everyone agreed. And then, um, it really, it was wrong of them, to be honest with you. The Western church, without consensus with the East, without telling them what they're going to do, <laughs> went and threw this word in there, in, in, in translation, where, this, where the creed says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Well, and when they use the word proceeds from the Father in Latin, they use the word filioque, which means proceeds from the Father and from the Son. Right? And that created a disturbance. You say, what's the problem? That with that, with that um, Latin Christianity explanation of the, of the um, Nicene constant, Constantinople, Constantinopolitan, Constantinopolitan, Constantinopolitan Creed. I can never say that word correctly. It's always uh, Nicaea Constantinople Creed, right? Constantinopolitan Creed, that word. It's from 381. Okay? So, um, I can spell it though. Constant. <laughs> no, I can't. Constantinopolitan Creed, that's it. That's it. Constantinopolitan Creed. Um, this is the creed in Nicaea, okay, and, and in Constantinople, all the bishops come together, they put the creed together back in 381 to, to tell the church this doctrine of who God is. We know who the Father is now, we know who the Spirit is now, we know who the Son is now, and when they did that, they never said, and from the Son. This edition, which, by the way, every Sunday at this church, we say it. We say, and from the Son, that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, 
right? The problem that presents that little filioque term, that's one of the reasons the church split. That and the cultural issues and who was in control, who had papacy, you know, who, which was the true pope who was going to be the leader of the bishops. Those cultural issues, the, the argument on papacy, but this is probably the biggest factor in there. Theologically, this is the biggest factor. Um, how dare you all say that the spirit comes and from the son? He either, he's from the father just like the son. He's not, because as soon as you say and from the son, now you made him what? Lesser than, according to the Eastern argument. Okay, so the Western Latin speaking is saying this. The Eastern Greek speaking is saying you can't say that. So we'll look at that in just a moment. But I wanted I wanted just to lay that out there for you. Okay, the original form of the creed says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. All right. So the first major split. That's part of the reason there it is. It's there, fighting about who is the Holy Spirit. Who is he? Because you guys just kind of like messed it up for us with that little phrase. Okay? And there's several reasons, both biblical and historical, for the rise of that addition. There's a reason they added this. So let's read these verses. Can you all read those very loudly for me? Talk to me as loud as I'm talking to you. Let's start with um, um, John 16 and 7. The New Testament itself is pretty ambiguous. You're going you're gonna to find out tonight. It's ambiguous, right? It's not, it's not specific enough about <clears throat> who the Holy Spirit proceeds from. Where does he come from? And you're going to see why. Um, this is what Jesus says in John 16 and 7. Someone read that out loud for me. Okay, so these are all John, so I'll just put the chapter in verse. So that's the verse that um, Elder Sylvia was referring to earlier. Who sends the Spirit? Jesus sends him. Jesus sends him. Where's the Spirit come from? Y'all speak loudly. It's back to me. According to that verse... 16 and 7, Jesus says, I must go away so that I can send the comforter to you. Who sends the Spirit? Jesus sends him. Why does he got to go away and send him? Does it mean that the Spirit's not here? Because he's been here since the beginning of creation. He's the one that came to you when you were baptized. Wait a second. What are you saying here? And it came from him, so I could and it, from him and to you. How, do you, how does the Spirit hover over your mother and put you in her? And now he comes from you. Exactly. You see the problems here, right? Okay, let's keep going. This is, why, this is where we get into hot water and, and, and in the debates, right? And then he'll send the spirit. Here, here he's called the, the parakletos, or what we say the paraclete, okay? Um, he'll send the spirit. But now let's look at chapter 15 and verse 26. Chapter 15 and verse 26. Who sends the spirit? Who is talking here? Jesus is talking again? Jesus does a lot of talking. And now he's confusing us. Because <laughs> first he says, I'm sending the Father. And now say it, read it, read it one more time. 1526, Jesus now is saying... Okay, so Jesus sends him, but he comes from the Father. Is that it? From the Father is what Jesus says. All right, let's go into 14, 26. Let's see what else, because this is helping straighten it out, isn't it? Yeah, sure it is. Oh, wait a second. I thought Jesus was sending, and then he was coming from the Father. But now you're saying the Father sends the advocate? As my representative. Keep going. All right. So which verse are you going to stand with? 
Which one is going to be your anchor verse to say this is where the spirit comes from? I mean, I would say in general it would be the Father, because at the end of the day, He's the Creator. All right, well, let's forget this right here. Jesus sends. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, because He's the Creator. He's the Creator. It, I mean, if we were going to go all the way to the beginning, He's the Creator of everything. So, so it has to come from the Father Himself, because He's the one that created the Son. So Jesus if he created the Son, then the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not created. Well, I, I I get that, but the Father. Wait, are the Father and the Son one? Yeah, but Jesus. But said, the Holy Spirit's I, not. But Jesus said, "I won't. I only do what my Father tells me." I only do what my Father tells me to do. But let me ask you this question: Does Jesus and the Father share? Um, do they share natures? No. Do they have the same essence? Are they one? Yes, they are. They are one? Then is the spirit one with them? How? Where, which one of those verses said that? I know that's what you believe, but which verse said it? The third one. The third one said what? As my rep. I mean, my representative and me are two different things. He will remind you of everything I've told you. Oh, he's a reminder. I'm, t I'm going off of that verse. You can't add me no other words Jesus didn't say. You, do you understand the issue I'm talking about? Here? Okay. So, so the Augustinian idea probably followed the other Latin writers that the Spirit shared this contributed idea of, of this is why this is exactly why they say you can't just say that he only comes from the Father. Because while he does, he also clearly comes from the Son. That's why they put in the, in the creed to explain who the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from both the Father and from the Son when they went into the Latin language which is what we say today in our churches, which is why you're defending the theology you believe, because you have a Western theology. And just laying down that in verse 28, it, he, says, he says clearly that the, the Father who is greater than I am. So he, he's already letting us know, because you ask, are they, are they not one? Or, but he says here himself, the Son, that the Father is actually greater than him. So what does it mean that the Father is greater than the Son? Does it take away from the Son? Is it a positional statement or is it a natural, natural, uh, natural statement, a, a statement about his nature? Does it mean that Jesus and the Father are not equals? That's the question. Is equality in the Godhead or not? Is there equality in the Godhead? Are the Father... Son and Spirit equally God? That's the question I'm asking. Are they equally God? Yet they have individuality. Yet they share oneness. So trying to explain that from Bible verses, you're going to have arguments all day long. How many get what I'm saying? Okay. So, so I think that what the what Augustine was doing is they're talking about let's add this and from the Son in order for, for it to be understood that yes and yes both are true. You get what I'm saying? It's not there to minimize the Spirit. It's there to show that he is as equal as the Father and the Son. That's, that's the idea, at least, we're told, behind this Western reason for putting this. Now, the problem is that when you, and I'm going deep tonight, so just help me here. Here is now the problem. Are you ready? That now you have 
painted the Holy Spirit with that statement, it people begin to conceive. I don't have to put this in quotation. No one actually said it. It's just what happens. That the Holy Spirit is non-personal. And I don't mean that he doesn't relate to you on a personal basis. I mean that he doesn't have his own person. Because as soon as you say he's from the Father and from the Son, oh, so he's not his own person, is the, image, is, is, is the beginning of the reasoning in the mind. And there's a reason for it because he cannot be his own person as the father and the son have always existed because he has now a beginning. Because you just told me where he comes from. You also just by using that language have given him a source. And anything that has a source is not a source itself. Who created God? My child asked that in the car today. Who made God? Nobody. That's why in our creed we say that Jesus, remember the creeds as they were developed, we had to clarify Jesus uh, begotten, not made of the Father. He is source. He is God. He has no beginning. He is the beginning. Yes? Right? Light from light, true God from true God, right? Those are the things we say. Now, if we're saying this about the spirit, then we are creating this is I'm giving you the argument that the Eastern Church is giving. The argument is, wait a second. Now you're giving them a beginning. Now you're now you're giving them a source, which is further minimizing his role. And and you are now de deifying him or undeifying him. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the question is, who is he? Is he or is he not equal with God? Is there a trinity? Or is there just a binary God and the spirit is their servant? Binary two, father, son, and the spirit is the servant. And the way some people preach it today in 2019, it's just the spirit of Jesus. It's Jesus' spirit, which, yeah, and the Father's spirit and his own spirit is what a Trinitarian is going to tell you. So how do you, how do you define who is, who is the Holy Spirit? The spirit led Jesus the Spirit anointed Jesus. The Spirit put Jesus in his mother's womb. The Spirit raised Jesus up from the dead. Jesus didn't raise himself up from the dead. Preachers are going to say that on Easter Sunday. And Jesus rose up from the dead. No, 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 no. no. Jesus didn't raise himself up. The Scripture clearly teaches that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The Spirit is the giver of life. Y'all missing this right here. The spirit. So wait a second now. Now we have a real argument. But do you see how the language, do you see why that little terminology right there is such an argument point? Because it then what and, and, and eventually what did happen in the Western church, just let me tell you, during the medieval years, that the Western church developed a really strong Christology study of Christ. They really got a strong development. The theologians are the best to describe who Jesus is, the son. They had a weak pneumatology study of the spirit. Guess who has a strong pneumatology? The Eastern Church. They have, though, their theologians are the ones that break open for us who the spirit is. The Cappadocian fathers, and then after that, even in the mid mid medieval century, then in the medieval years, we have Catholic theologians who who began to par up with the Eastern Church, but it, they took Eastern Church took the lead to explain who the Spirit is. The Western Church kind of lagged for some years, some centuries. You, you guys get this? You see it in their worship services today. You see it in the amount of charismatic activity. Miracles, signs, wonders, giftings of the Spirit. 
in the sacraments in the Eastern Church versus in the Western Church because it still plagues people's minds. They don't know it's there, but it's there. Y'all catching this? That's not to say that the, the Western Church is not charismatic. Obviously, the biggest char you know who's the biggest charismatic group, Pentecostal group in the world? Anybody know? The number one group, Assemblies of God. Number two group, Roman Catholic Church. They have more tongue-speaking people, I think, in number, flat out more than the Assemblies of God, actually, but not more churches. Charismatic people who, you know, by charismatic, I'm talking about manifest the life of the Spirit in their worship and in their personal lives. All right, so that's on record. Those are numbers you can't argue with that. That's today. So now, I'm not saying that the Western Church doesn't have, but what I'm saying is that historically, one began to develop one theology stronger than the other. All right, questions, comments before I move on? Because Jesus said, whatsoever you ask in my name shall be given unto you. Go in my name and the Father is going to answer you. So we get that. You know. But, then he but, comes and tells us. but see, you, you cannot divide in your mind that the Spirit and Jesus are not one. They're one. But they do have different personas. Remember that non-personal word I used here? They do, they do have that, and that's another problem I, I, I pointed to last week when I said that in the Latin, in English today, when you say, oh, I'm my own person, what are you saying when you say, I'm my own person? We don't know you're a person? We're saying you're an individual in our culture today. That's not the culture 2,000 years ago. In, in, our, in the culture 2,000 years ago, that individuality is really it's a novelty in human history never in human history do people see themselves as individuals until the 1700s prior to that for thousands of years thousands 6000 BC 4000 BC 2000 BC 2000 years ago people saw themselves as part of a community as part of a whole the concept of individualism doesn't come till later so, so, so when the Bible, when, when, when in the Latin, again, this is a problem, when Augustine begins to explain to the church in his teachings who the Holy Spirit is, he talks about one God in three, say it again, one God in what? Three persons. three persons. But the word persons there, he was not talking about individuality. That's never what he meant. His, his doctrine and all his writings and teaching clearly tell you that the Holy Spirit is not an individual. Neither is Jesus, neither the Father. He always talks about the three of them working together. When he uses the word persona there for the Latin, it does not mean what it means in our culture today. Persona simply meant that he manifests different characteristics than that of the Son and that of the Father. That, there's a, that you can see that, that he's, he's someone else. And Jesus is someone else. And the Father is someone else. Yet the three of them are what? One. All right. So, so I want to just say, throw that nugget out there. Let's get an alternative for this, and then I'm going to give us a working definition, and we'll be on our way. All right? I, I didn't get nowhere near where I wanted to go. I had, I had 12 pages, and I'm on page one. Okay? So let me give you an alternate for the, to the filioque. Um, And I think, I'm, I'm going to say this to you because this is the Western explanation for what that meant. They never meant to say what the Eastern Church accuses them of, but I get the Eastern Church's arguments. I totally understand why the East is making a fuss. It's true. 
what they're saying is true. Look at all, the, all that he creates, right? So it, it's important to keep language together. So an, altern, an alternate to, to Filioque would read that he's from, from the Father. Watch this. From the Father through the Son. From the Father through the Son. Not instead of saying and from the Father and from the Son. Instead of saying from the Father and from the Son, we should have said from the Father through the Son. That would have, this little term through instead of from would have removed source, beginning, and non-person and non-person from the Holy Spirit argument. We would have understood, ah, Father, Son, Spirit, still equal. He comes to us where? Through the Son. Yes? You say, well, what about the beginning? In the beginning, the Holy Spirit was moving on the waters. Jesus was not here. But Jesus, was, Jesus is in the beginning. He's clearly in the beginning because the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes? Who's God? Father, Son, Spirit. And, and the Spirit of the Lord was what? Moving over the waters. And God said, let there be light. That let there be light, that God saying, that's the word. That's, that's the verb. That's God's voice. Who's that? That's the sun. And so through the sun, light was created. Who put the light there? Who put the energy there? The spirit, the life giver, the energies of God. You catch that? So they're active in the beginning. It's just not explicit. It's implicit. Yes. Let us make man in our own image. Uh, watch this. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. There's a plurality there, so we know there's at least two, if not more, right? And this is how we get the three. It, through the doctrine of scripture, we understand there's three of them. That the Father's saying, let us make man in our image, right? The fact that, the, the fact that God is saying it, the saying of it is, is Jesus. Watch this now. And then what does he do when he puts his finger in the mud and he, he makes the man in the dust? What does he do to animate the man? And, and the word breathe is the same word for spirit. The spirit comes to him right there. Right? So you have the spirit coming through the word, the son. Yes? From the father, the creator. Let us make father, creator. Let us make man in our image. Who's the image of the father? Book of Hebrews says Jesus is the express image of the father. Yes? Chapter 1, Hebrews 1. So you have the Father creating, you have the image of Jesus present, and the fact that it's being spoken, and then you have the action being taken in the formation and the breath, the Spirit coming. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, there's a few other places you see the, the plurality there. Um, but, but there's no explicit teaching, is the problem. Yeah, LDJ? Yeah, but in the creed, it's also stated that he's from the beginning, right? And that Jesus is not made, he's begotten of the Father. So it doesn't source Jesus. It tells us where he emanates from. And the same thing should have been used for the Spirit. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Anybody who's lost, say amen. amen. All right, we'll help you find your way. We'll pray. <laughs> say that again. That's an alternate to filioque. The through part is how the spirit works in conjunction with the son, never separating them, keeping them as both advocates, keeping them in equality. Yeah, we could put the word and right there, and we'll fix it in, and through the sun. That's fine. Yeah. So it, it gives you the distinction, right? Source and through and, right? Yeah, okay. 
But, but, it, but what I'm saying is that using the word through instead of from makes a big difference. I was reading, um, um, last week I read St. Basil all week long. I just read his sermons in and out. I was reading his teachings all week long. And one of the things that, that Basil says over and over and over, um, Basil of Caesarea, one of the Cappadocian fathers, right? One of the early second century uh, church father who just developed so much doctrine, second, third century. And one of the things he says is we need to pay attention to the words that we use. He says, because if the Bible, if Jesus said that heaven and earth shall not pass, right, nor any jot or tittle shall pass. He says, if, if God is paying attention to jots and tittles, you know what jots and tittles are, right? The, they're, um, they're, the top, they're the dots and the, and the little symbols over language in words. Those are jots and tittles. He said, that can't even come to pass. That can't be undone. Until, the, until it's linked to the purpose of God. He said, if God links his purposes to jots and tittles, we can't play around with words in the church and in doctrine and in teaching and in preaching. We, our words have to be very exact because we're dealing with the holy. We're dealing with the divine. Because you might be sitting here saying, oh, what's the big fuss all about? We're dealing with the divine. Notice how one word changes the concept of who the divine is. Someone will be absolutely lost not understanding who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God. That's who he is. He's God. And, and, he, and he's equal. So I want to I draw something for you that Sister Denise sent me last week, which was great. Um, and I want you to draw it out or take a picture of the drawing. Because <laughs> it's going to help you to explain to folks who is and who is not God. Uh, we talked about modalism a little bit last week. Modalism is this teaching that says, well, there are three um, expressions of the same person. It's only one person, and then uh, God sometimes shows himself as a father, and then the same person, sometimes he shows up as the son, and the same time, sometimes he shows up as the spirit. But it's just the one person. That's modalism. And the problem with that teaching is that you're saying God's taking on different modes, that he's shape-shifting. That's not three people. That's one person with uh, three identities. That's someone who's schizophrenic. You get what I'm saying? You have to distinguish the fact that he is his own uh, Latin word, persona. Does that make sense to you? So we, 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 you go back to last week's teaching, you'll remember that because we said a lot. And you'll go back and you'll see the, the distinction there. This is going to help you also. So let's put God right here in the center. And we're going to imagine that everything I'm about to draw for you is exact measurement. So it's going to be a perfectly centered picture, but it's really not going to be. All right. And we're going to put the Father right here. We're going to put the, oh, look it, I got a one, two, three, five, one, two, three. Uh-huh. I'm getting pretty close to the center. We're going to put the sun. Right. And then we're going to put the spirit. Oh, but the spirit circle is smaller, so I got to make it bigger because now I'm taking away from who he is. Now I'm overcompensating. Now I'm exalting him over Jesus. <laughs> All right. Okay. The spirit, the father, the son, all three of them are God. Yes? yes. Let me ask you this question. Is the Father God? Yes. So let's put is. He is. Is the Son God? Yes. He is. Is the Spirit God? Yes. He is indeed God. 
Yeah? Are we right so far? Let me ask you this. Is the spirit the son? Y'all have pause. Are they the same persona? I'm going to go with the guesses. I'm looking at your faces and the head shaking is not. The spirit is the spirit. Yes? Is the spirit the son? No. Is the son the father? No. Is not. I mean, is the father the son? No. Has anybody seen the father? No. Let me ask you this. Is the father the spirit? No. Is not. But is the spirit God? Is the father God? Is the son God? He's not the sun god, but he, the sun is god. Yes, yes. All right. All right. But he is not. See, so what this image is showing you is this very complicated imagery. It's a complicated understanding of how, and, and let, me, let, me, um, let me properly title this The Trinitarian Mystery of the Godhead. Let me properly title that. We're talking about who the Godhead is. That God is a being who is shared, who coexists. And man, I had some good teaching for you tonight in terms, I never got to the orthodox terminology and stuff. How much time we got? It's late. I got three minutes. Let me, let me just give you these words so that you understand. The theology of the Father starts with the word hypostasis. <laughs> when we talk about God is not created in the Greek the Greek, the Greek word is usia. This is what the, the theologians used in the creeds that, that mean for us that he is an uncreated being. Uncreated being. Nobody made him. He's an uncreated being. Jesus Christ is the son of is the son and I'm going to put I'm going to put now here God man but he's an uncreated being yeah remember going back to the creeds he's he's all human all man and yet he's all God he's an uncreated being yeah Jesus Christ is the son, the God-man of the uncreated father. <laughs> right? And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the uncreated father. They're all uncreated. Uncreated, God-man, uncreated. They're all uncreated. That's really important to know. Because how do you worship something that's created? Can't. He's uncreated. He is to be worshipped. He is creator. He's there at creation. Right? Um, and in the Trinity, just to understand, and I, I'm, I'm going over my head, but I'll, we'll pick up here next time.
in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is just the energies of God. What he is is the energy, the power, the movement that's happening there. So the Spirit's always in movement, in motion. Let me give you this one last thing. I started with hypostasis, but I didn't tell you what that was. Hypostasis is this word in the Greek hypostasis is this word in the Greek that equals the word being that word right there hypostasis but he's an uncreated being and what the creeds say is that the son and the father share a hypostasis, a hypostatic union. They share a being. Yes? Yes? <laughs> let me put it, let me put it even clearer for you. Existence of being, hypostasis. Jesus shares a hypostatic union. He exists as a being with the Father. Yes or no? Does he share that? This is, this is the hypostatic union right here. This is the Godhead. This is the union. This is hypostasis right here. What's happening inside of here is a, an existence of a being. Right in there. And Jesus shares that with the Father. Did you catch that? And he is uncreated. He is usia. He's just always been there. And he became flesh. The flesh part was created, but not him in his wholeness. He's 100% flesh, but he's also 100% his uncreated being. Okay? Now, here's where it got tricky. That when, uh-huh. Say that again? Does hypostasis pertain to being, Jesus being God? God man, yeah. He has hypostasis with the Father, right? And he's also sharing the fullness of manhood. So he is hypostatically, he is both God and man. Right. He shares manhood 100% and he shares Godhead 100%. Make sense to you? The Holy Spirit does not. Holy Spirit is the Spirit. He never became a man. The Father never became a man. Only Jesus did. Make sense to you? All right. I'm going to break it down right here and we're going to end because I'm going to go back to the filioque right here. The problem with the filioque is that it says the Spirit comes from the Father and from the Son and then it, it, and, and it left this out. It left the isness out. In the filioque, the problem. the problem is that in the language, from the Father and from the Son, but it left this part out that he's not God himself. He just comes from them. And the problem is that what is it that connects you here? What is it? Hypostasis. But in the Greek, it's hypostasis. What's the word hypostasis in Latin? They didn't have one. So in the Latin, they just said he's a person. Persona. He's a person. Also, he's not God. He doesn't share hypostatic union. They didn't have a word to describe that. So they just made him a person. You see the problem? So... This right here is the Latin problem in language. I told you, I don't think they meant to say that that way to cause problems, but language creates problems. Or it helps. So Bishop, what's the word in English? 
In the English language, there's nothing to tell us hypostasis. The word we use is trinity. The word we use is mystery. The word we use is Godhead. We use different terminologies to try to explain this perfect union of the three. We don't have that. We don't have anything that say they share usia. They share being, uncreated being. They just share this energy, this life source. This, this existence is just there. I would think that the closest word we have to it in English is existence. They share an existence. They have always existed together. Where one exists, the other two exist. They cannot exist apart from each other. Make sense to you? Boy, language is important, isn't it? Any questions before we leave? Okay. So the problem with the deal is that the spirit comes from the father and from the son, but you said they left the middle part. The is, the is, the is is this right here, the usia. The hypostasis. That's is. There was no word for hypostasis in Latin. So we use the word filioque, uh, which, which is in English, it translates into and from the sun. What they were trying to get at was that the spirit comes from the both of them. But you didn't say he is with the both of them. You said he came from the both of them. And if he comes from the both of them and he's not, he's, and it, you're not saying he is the both, he is with the both of them. He exists with the both of them. Now you're giving them a source. Now you're giving them a persona. Now you're, 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 you're minimizing his role. So it, it would have been better to say that the spirit comes from the father, from the father through the son. The spirit comes from the father through the son and is God. Did you catch that? Look at, look at the motion of my hand. The Spirit comes from the Father through the Son and is God. He shares the existence with them. That's who he is. He's not the Son and he's not the Father. He is the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, and then the creeds go on to say, and he is to be worshipped. How do you say he is to be worshipped if he's not God? He is to be worshipped. He is to be reverent. He is to be feared. He is to be followed. We are to depend on him because he is the giver of life. Come on, amen? He is the, he is, he is the energy of God himself. You ever buy a beautiful appliance and when you plugged it in, there was no power to it? Because it had no Holy Spirit. <laughs> you can't have God without power. He is the very essence of God. He shares it with us. Amen? Good stuff, right? So, hey, we'll get to the other pages another day. All right? Because we had a lot of scriptures and a lot of other stuff. Next week we'll do our training and then we'll do the following week. Oh yeah? <laughs> We're done. <laughs> I'll share it at another time. I'll share it at another time. Amen? Any other comments? No? Head hurts or it's okay now? It hurts. You know what? When I watch one rabbi teaching on the Trinity, he had a fidget spinner to show what God is. And he spins it around. He says, now watch the power of it as it moves. 
It's a fit, and he has the three in, in one. He says, you, he says, you take one of them out, it won't spin. I don't care which of the three you're pulling out. When you pull one of them out, it will not spin. So, yeah. And when it spins, it really just looks like one. <laughs> yeah. I should have, I sh I'll bring that video maybe sometime and show it to you. Yeah. I think it was a rabbi who was explaining. It could have been a priest, but. Orthodox priest, but it was one of them. Amen. Good stuff, right? And and the thing is that when you begin to see it that way, you see it in all the scriptures. Now you see it in the scripture over and over and over. But there was no one that none of the scriptures explicitly told us that. But when you begin to see it, now you can filter the scriptures through that and say, yep, that works everywhere. You see it everywhere in the scriptures. Amen. Okay. Let us pray. Father, heal our heads. Strengthen our spirit. <laughs> Help us to know you more and more. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is, Holy Spirit, to know you, to live with you as you live with us right in our very bodies, our temples for you. And I pray that you help us and teach us to honor you in all things. Help us to grow in understanding. Help us to develop healthy relationship with you in everything that we do that we might glorify the father and 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 show the world who christ is we pray in jesus name amen